Okay, take two of uh, the idea. Uh, it's, uh, it's a weird idea, but I think uh, it, should, it would could be quite useful. Um, and the idea is actually quite, well, on principle, it's uh, not that complicated to implement. Uh, that being said, the most important thing is how the idea and uh, or ideas and uh, technology in general or even memes, how they get uh, evolved. Uh, I guess you could say the same for culture because uh, it's all part of the new sphere. I think that's how you say it, N-O-O-S-P-H-E-R-E. -E. Uh, it's a term, I think somebody in Russia uh, came up with this term and then others have built up on it. So in this collective new sphere, uh, there are all these different ideas. Some are, uh, some are, uh, some actually do make life better. Uh, global healthcare system. I'm actually biased when I say this. It depends how you do this, right? So if you're like, no, no, we should do a global healthcare system, and it's gonna make life better for everyone, and secretly you're like, oh, it's gonna help make us a lot of money. Uh, I, I, I. I yeah, I mean, I kind of like, I, I guess the initial condition would be matter. Let's put it that way. Um, what's another example? I don't know. I can't come up with specific examples right now, but I think the intentions really matter. And uh, this, is a, this is a longer conversation, but I, I sincerely hope that ideas and technology are implemented for helping make life better because uh, there's a lot of challenges that we face right now and potentially coming our way. Uh, and I think we need to start taking a more global approach to these things um, without going to that conversation. Uh, I want to spend time talking about the ethics uh, of the implementation of this idea and other ideas because, and you know, I, 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 this, this, I don't know if Hal Finney, who's a computer scientist, actually said this. I don't know much about him, but. Uh, apparently, he was in contact with uh, the individual or individuals who started the whole modern crypto movement, and well, particularly with regards to the uh, well, Bitcoin enabled on top of the blockchain. But you know, apparently, Finney said that the computer can be used as a tool to liberate and protect people rather than to control them. And I think this very succinctly summarizes what I'm trying to say. So I'll just point back to that quote from Finney. That being said, here is the idea. And many years ago on a different blog, I made this post about computing enabled by voice. So voice enabled computing. And I, I always thought, this was before Siri. And I always thought like uh, the designs that we make use of go back to Douglas Engelbart from the sixties. Mother of all demos, if you haven't seen that video on YouTube, uh, type mother of all demos, Douglas Engelbart. I think if you just type mother of all demos, that comes up anyways. It's remarkable. It's remarkable what individuals were doing in the 60s. Uh, I, I think there was a core group of innovators and pioneers uh, in a variety of different areas doing some really pioneering work in human computer interaction, in genetics, in rocketry. Uh, in, uh, you know, Gerard O'Neill with the vision of uh, having colonies in space, some phenomenal groundbreaking, really pioneer, pioneering work. Uh, so anyway, segue back to computing enabled, uh, voice enabled, uh, computing enabled on top of uh, voice controls or voice enabled computing. Um, I, I was thinking more in terms of GIS and so the coming to this idea, and if I, I, can, I hope I can share, uh, I, I, don't, I, think, I don't know what this company does, but when I type GIS, this is one of the first links that came up. So uh, I actually don't even know what GIS stands for. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought it stands for, that geographic information system. Um, so I think most of the GI is very focused from a visual perspective and then collecting data. So there's different kind of data that you can connect, collect, uh, not just from orbit, you could have UAVs or uh, other uh, mechanisms or systems uh, or machines uh, collecting data or, um, and 
And then you can represent this data in a variety of different format. You can obviously create maps. Like I said, you know, the data itself, you could look at it from a variety of different perspectives, uh, find correlation in between those patterns. So maybe there's something to do with moisture and, you know, the, the certification aspect or the opposite moisture and uh, forests, you know, how they kind of go hand in hand. Maybe there's a wind component to it. Uh, more recently, I, there's a gentleman from uh, the middle, Israel actually, and uh, we, we took the same class in last summer and he was saying he can predict earthquakes in a region by looking at the, uh, the light pattern on top of a region. Some, something to do with like something more on a particular altitude. So he's got a patent on that. That's, uh, that, that could be super, super useful, particularly in places like uh, Japan and um, uh, even parts of California sitting on uh, uh, tech, well, fault lines. More so Japan. Japan's like sitting on kind of like a ring of fire, as their region's called. So, but anyway, so come back to GIS. That's uh, been historically the way GIS has evolved. Like it's a combination of the data that is collected um, and the sim, like the links between that data set, as well as uh, there's I think a big visual element to it. So this is a crazy idea, but I was thinking, I was thinking about the frogs and I was thinking about the insects and uh, the population has been in a decline for many decades. And I think this could be a big problem. Uh, so I was thinking, what if, you know, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna think in the philosophical terms. I just, that is, that's a very good question. If there was no one around uh, if, if a tree fell in a forest and no one was around to hear it, would it still make a noise, right? <laughs> so I think, I think that's a very interesting philosophical question in regards to, um, uh, while I'm not, well, the way I think like the nature of reality, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about, I'm not gonna go on that philosophical tangent. I was just thinking uh, sound and also maybe smell. So let's go back to the idea. So the idea is to have a, uh, like a snapshots of sound and smells over a period of time. And then the word that kind of popped at me was, maybe this is not the right word, but like a particular definition of when you add dash scape, you know, landscape, or um, I don't know what else, like uh, I can't think of any other example, but it, it's, it's, it's uh, like a spectrum. Like, so if like you look at light, light is a, uh, is a collection of different spectrums. Uh, the visible light is, uh, is, is that I believe um, uh, you can split the colors up in seven different bands and uh, each one of those bands have, is that something to do with the, uh, the electrons and how they, I think, absorb energy. Uh, so each one of them is on a different like a wavelength and somehow that, that combines together to form photons and we see like light coming in a coherent kind of singular fashion, but it's actually a collection of different, uh, I guess, waves or part. I, I don't understand how the whole thing works. But yeah, that's, that's a, I think that's how I'm kind of looking at it. Like, so um, it's the, the, the word scape kind of came to me and I, I was thinking if you could really create a snapshot of sounds and smells over uh, different parts of the earth, then it could help give um, like an indicator of what's going on with this planet uh, or any planet. Uh, now that we're gonna be doing a breakthrough star shot, uh, this would be actually pretty cool if breakthrough star shot uh, wasn't just focused on the visual aspect, but it could actually go into uh, but there's a big contamination issue. If we're sending probes into other planets and we end up contaminating those planets, we're gonna end up, we're, we could end up wiping out a lot of life on, in the galaxy in the, at least in the, like the local cluster. So say somehow we, we can sp spend like a tiny probe, 90% of the speed of light, you know, it gets there six years and we can do like hundreds, thousands of these. But if they're infected and they go inside the planet, 
and the life there, whatever form that it may be in. These are a lot of supposition, like assumptions that I'm making. But it, what if all of this happened to be true and was possible? Then if our probes are infected, because uh, there's going to be bacteria and vi potentially viruses that can indeed survive this long distance uh, voyage for many years, then once they enter that habitat, they could cause a lot of destruction. Uh, so it's something we need to be really, really mindful of if and when, if we do implement this idea in its world. But we can definitely do this on Earth. And I think, you know, this again, like it's every, like going back to what I started with, every idea can be implemented in different ways. And I wouldn't be surprised if somebody's actually doing something like this already uh, for uh, both purposes, universally good and potentially universally bad. Anyway, so, so to come back to the idea and I love, I like frogs and I like insects, I like other animals too. And I think we have, we are part of the same bios, we're definitely part of the same system, same biosphere. So I don't want to be like a scaremonger, but things happening to the frogs and the insects and the bees could be an indicator of what may happen to us in the next couple of decades. So that, you know, like, and I'm not a biologist, so I don't know what I'm talking about here. But to come back to the idea, if there was indeed a snapshot of sound and smell over a period of time, then what you would do is, and these are free images, Creative Commons licenses. So this is for sound, right? But we could do something similar for maybe smells. Uh, going back to the 90s, I remember seeing there was there was some preliminary work happening in this domain, at least in the domain, in, in the terms of inventions. And so you can you can digitally represent certain smells. If you can now represent certain smells, then you, uh, and here at least in principle, you should have a means to be able to decode that smell and turn into like some uh, digital signature. So the just to be able to like document a snapshot of what it is. But on the sounds, like we could just start with sound. So this is an average size input for recording and an analog signal. We call it a mic or microphone. Um, so what if we could minimize or uh, so mini miniaturize this, right? What if we could shrink the size by some exponential function uh, and make it really, really cheap to do so? And then what we next do is we spread this out amongst, uh, we spread this out, uh, I don't know who's gonna do this and what are gonna be the ethics by which you do this and what are gonna be the safeguards by which you uh, ensure that a technology like this will not be abused, right? But what if like there were like sensors, I can't, um, I can't, uh, yeah, well, what if you could spread this out in the forest? Like, you know, you, you, could, you could make these sensors biologically biodegradable and you had, like, you wouldn't have this much in this space. But say, um, can I stop doing this and scroll down? So yeah, there would be some ratio. Say this, you know, the stuff in the background is an area over, I don't know, two kilometers, right? Uh, so depending on uh, you know, and it, there would be like a different set of gradients. So if you were in the rainforest, you would have a higher saturation of uh, the, the sensors. But if you were in a desert environment, maybe not, because the only creatures we expect to uh, go around there are maybe like some scorpions and random motor, uh, like a desert, um, what else is it? Like a hawk, maybe once in a while. Uh, camels through caravans passing by, you know, occasionally, uh, stuff like that. Uh, you know, could, I, I don't know what else lives in the desert. But depending on, on where you are, and this is, I gotta erase this now, depending on where you are would, would determine uh, how much of those sensors you actually need. Uh, so next, what's going to happen is uh, the sound's gonna get recorded and there's gonna be a snapshot and then you're gonna be recording different sounds, right? So if you're in the rainforest, it's potentially 
it's recording the sounds of the crickets, you know, the bats, maybe something crawling on the, it depends on how sensitive the sensor is, something's crawling on the floor, uh, maybe you have sensors on the floor and on, you know, on the, somewhere else. Um, this is definitely a, uh, a weird out there idea, but but just like let's let's just uh, let's hear hear me out. <laughs> no pun intended. I guess pun intended in this case. Um, so then there will be a snapshot of the sounds on a slice of time, right? And it would record all of these sounds. Now the thing is that's just an analog signal converted into something potentially you are going to store it in a digital medium. But what can you now do with that system? That's that's a good. I, I don't know if I should say it to myself, that's a good question. And that then that question then reminded me of this this once video I saw on two minute papers. I think this is the video. I could be wrong, but they somebody trained an AI to isolate speech signals. And I think this is the same. It could be another one. But basically, there was an there's an AI that can. Um, so say there's a room full of 500 people, right? I, I think this is a different video, but I, I guess at least I can convey the idea. So say there's a room full of 500 people and again, good and ethical and non-ethical uh, use of any idea and technology applies to this as well. But I don't think we should let that prevent us from sharing ideas openly. Uh, that would not be a good world, but that's again another conversation. So come back, coming back to the the thing I was talking about, if there were five hundred people in one say ballroom or something like that, then the AI could isolate on the thing you want to isolate on. So amongst all the signals, it could be like that one or two, uh, you know, signals out of the potentially five hundred. You could just isolate on that, and you could. Everything else would be the noise, that would be the signal. And so we can already get the AIs to do that, right? So if we can do that, and then now we have a global system whereby there's sensors spread out in different geographies, and we can give it a type and a categorization, a taxonomical structure. So we'd say, well, here's the rainforest in this part of Brazil. And based on the snapshot, we have, you see, there will be many models here. So, you know, the models would be, we would, somebody would have to train them to say, I, I think that's, I don't know how unsupervised learning works, but somebody would say, well, this is what a cricket sounds like. And this is what the bats like flapping their wings sound like. Um, and, uh, you know, this is how a lynx walking on the, the leaves, dry leaves sounds like. And if it sounds like this, then it's probably a bigger cat Right, some something like that. The examples are not so great. Uh, this buzzing is from a hummingbird of this size, and you know that's a wasp. Uh, and then you can collate that with uh, maybe uh, uh, visual data as well. Uh, I don't know what the computation uh, requirements and like that would be. If the sensors are not biodegradable, they're going to end up creating a lot of trash. Uh, depends on how many of these sensors you need. So uh, that would be really bad because uh, you're going to need leave uh, traces of uh, these metals and whatnot and potentially pollute the environment, which again, like I said, the sensors somehow have to be made out of biodegradable materials. I don't know how that's going to happen. But but now you have the data coming in. It's again turned into something uh, digital. Then you can uh, segment that data set and you can again train the AIs to get better at this pattern recognition. So as the data is coming in and going through the different funnels, you, you have like a, you have a pictorial, like a not pictorial, you have a, some kind of representation of what this, this, this soundscape's looking like, or the sound and smellscape, if the smell is actually uh, incorporated that, and then maybe there's some visual element to it, right? So uh, what what's, this is gonna help us do is, uh, May, may have a have some kind of a health, uh, like a true health indicator of what the the biosphere uh, is really like in total, uh, and you could focus on specific 
areas and say, well, this is what the health of the biosphere is like right now, right? And then you can again collate it with other maybe GIS data. So if you have like an algal bloom happening uh, in a particular region, you can say, oh, well, the temperature is going up. That's why the algae is being uh, growing. And this is why, you know, there's a loss of certain species. And that's maybe why the sounds are changing over here over the past five, 10 years, something like that, right? Or you could say, oh, uh, in Amazon or, you know, somewhere else, because I don't think we have enough good data on this outside of North America. You could say, well, uh, if this say the system was implemented in uh, the early 2000 or maybe the, in 1980s or 1990s, and you could say, when we used to have uh, the models, uh, when we used to run the models, just check and see if it's still recording. Uh, back in the 80s or 90s, we would hear a lot of frogs chirping. And, and, uh, and uh, now it's very few, or you know, it's not as much, so, so they, whatever the data represents. So, uh, you know, so 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 that 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 would that would that would that would uh, that, that that would be that be that 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 would, that's a use case I can think of. So this reminds me of a show Bull. I don't know if this is the video, but there's one of his videos. A show a show Bull. I've I've never met any one of these individuals. Uh, not the uh, crypto people. Not a show Bull, who's a cognitive uh, professor of cognitive and computer sciences, I believe. I got some stuff still here. And um, one of the things I believe he made was, um, I think this is like a taxonomical structure built on some kind of a uh, mo mo engine because uh, his expertise is on co in cognitive uh, computing. Uh, I took, I, I took uh, like a couple of like of his lectures on Udacity when the course was available for free. I didn't complete the course, uh, but um, I think one of his systems is like this categorization of life. It's it's kind of like a uh, like a somewhat like uh, it, it, it like the model was supposed to categorize life based on certain parameters. I don't I can't remember exactly how it worked or what the main even proposition was. But I was thinking like maybe something like that could be leveraged to uh, to bring some automation in order to do what I, I just shared. Um, so yeah, I think that's really my idea in a nutshell. It's like a snapshot of uh, mostly sounds, maybe smells, if that can indeed be modeled. Uh, digitally or to some mechanism. Uh, uh, smells could be useful in order to be able to, because when you go through a particular, you know, like uh, smells indicate stuff, you know, smells indicate like when, when you were in, in the earth, the ocean smells a particular way, uh, particular oceans, like if you go to a, like a Half Moon Bay in California, it smells a particular way. And it's a combination of the algae and the, uh, you know, sorry, the seaweeds, the marine life, and uh, you know maybe the shells. And it's a mix of all of those smells. That so Half Moon Bay has a particular smell. Uh, if you went to Maldives right now, uh, uh, Maldives, the beaches in Maldives would smell a particular way. But right now they would also smell off, uh, well, I hope the cleanup is done now, but there was a big cleanup around the Maldives area. Uh, or was it Mauritius? I forget. I think it was Mauritius. Uh, yeah, Mauritius. So it would smell off the uh, oil spill right now, but you can also tell there's people living there, but um, that's maybe not a good example. But, but uh, you know, algal blooms may smell a particular way, so you could uh, well, again, we have GIS. Uh, but what if you what, what what if you wanted to do something like this on other planets? And uh, hey, so maybe I can I can come in up with good examples. Yeah, I think this is a this is the idea in a nutshell. I don't know what to call this, but I think it, this would help us 
come up with some kind of a in, indicator of what's really going on with the biosphere in in general. So it wouldn't so much be a visual uh, indicator based on vis like visual cues. It would be more so the sound aspect. Like, what are the sounds? What are the sounds, and what do they represent? Um, I guess something like this could also be implemented in the city cityscape, and uh, that we're already starting to see because in places like New York uh, City, you have systems which can detect certain sounds and certain triggers go off based on those certain sounds. But I wasn't thinking in more in the civilian space or uh, for the purposes of uh, security. Uh, well, not security in that context. I was thinking biosphere. Bio, bio, no, bio, uh, biosphere. I was thinking really the biosphere. Okay, so I'm just gonna put this idea out there. Uh, may saner miles minds prevail, and uh, may we have the capacity to be able to continue to change ourselves and think positive thoughts. Um, I try to really do that and. We need to leave the world slightly better than we found it. Uh, I want my daughter to live in a in a beautiful world and a sustainable world. You know, uh, our systems are still vibrant. And, uh, we have abundance, and I think we should expend the time to think about these problems because the problems are not going to solve themselves and I think we need to keep a healthy balance uh, realizing that a lot of trends are positing that the world keeps getting better and there's definitely a lot of abundance coming our way but we also should be mindful of the biosphere what's what are what are our collective actions doing to the biosphere and I've, I've I can't say I don't you know like you know I'm not gonna talk about what I do and don't I don't eat red meat. I, I, I ate like a beef burger after uh, like, this must be five or six years now. And I, I accidentally mistakenly ordered burgers and I forgot to tell the counter person, um, or like the individual at the burger place to make them vegetarian. But I've stopped eating burgers now, period. I, I still do eat chicken and uh, fish. Uh, but even like things like plastic bags, uh, I, can, I guess I can do a better job uh, at all of this and packaging and what else? Uh, yeah, that's, you know, like start, start there. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying, like, or the, the I'm, I'm trying to uh, be more mindful of coffee and tea. Uh, not to, I stopped drinking black tea, not because of uh, sustainability, but more so I found out it's got tons of pesticides. So uh, that's also an opportunity, but I'm not going to go into this longer list because I don't want to sound all that. I don't think I'm the most sustainable person on this planet. I still drive a gasoline car. I uh, still put some of the groceries in uh, plastic bags. Um, what else? Yeah, I think those are the two. Um, I take long showers, but we have a lot of water in Ontario. Uh, actually, my showers are like not as long now. Yeah, I, mean, I think that would, that would primarily be it. Um, yeah, otherwise I think of carbon footprints pretty pretty low. I think I could be wrong. Uh, but yeah, this is my idea of the day, soundscape. Uh, this could also be useful if loggers go in somewhere unauthorized. So you could have a GIS component to it. Somehow if they were able to mask that, maybe they put something on top of their machines so that it didn't come up in the thing, you know, the sound would uh, send the trigger. Um, and for, for things like this, I'm with 
uh, uh, I was going to say Sir Arthur Clark, uh, Isaac Asimov. Uh, I was going to confuse that with Isaac Arthur. Uh, I, I, Isaac Asimov, I believe, uh, made the case for some kind of a global system for governance. Uh, I would just like to see some kind of cooperation happening uh, amongst humans so that things like safeguarding uh, the core assets like the Amazon, uh, the freshwater lakes, the river system, the oceans, uh, human health in random order, uh, that there was some kind of coordination and cooperation around this. Uh, the, the forest in uh, Southeast Asia and elsewhere, um, I think there should, there needs to be some kind of a uh, cooperation there. I think Asimov was saying, who owns the rain, like the Amazon? Uh, does Brazil own this or do the people of the earth own this? Because if Brazil owns it, then say something happens and the government changes in Brazil and they say, well, we're going to chop down 50% of the Amazon or we're just going to let that happen. We're not going to have that. I'm just making this up. But, but what if something like this happened? Like who's responsible in this case? And that's going to be pretty bad because those are the lungs of the earth. Uh, and the biosphere, I believe, is, I don't know if it's how resilient it is, how uh, from, from the perspective of where we are in the food web, right? The biosphere is going to keep going because we've had five extinction events, the major ones at least. I don't know how many in total, probably many, but life keeps evolving. It takes a long time, but it just keeps evolving. Uh, but we are on a fragile, this earth place is quite fragile the way I see it. And we, you know, we, I think we should be mindful of that because if we're not mindful, that could be our extinction, the human extinction based on our own actions, uh, which would be stupid. Uh, we just like, that would mean in the evolutionary or cosmic, in cosmic terms, we were maybe very slightly different from the dinosaurs in spite of all of the machines and quantum computers and uh, the internet, and, you know, uh, I don't even know what kind of technology exists out there. But I guess, that's, I guess my point is made. Um, that, would, that would be pretty, uh, or we're, you know, like they say, well, solar flares could, uh, or gamma ray bursts could ex explain the, the, the Fermi paradox, which is like going in the astrophysics domain that's not really on topic. I was talking about brought about by human actions, right? So, yeah, I think there, there's a sustainability angle and uh, offloading the pressure off of our systems. And this is why. I'm biased when I say this, I'm personally invested in, in these areas. Uh, so take whatever I say with a, rip it apart. Uh, you know, if in any shape or form, it seems like this is uh, coming across as a, uh, some a clever mechanism of, you know, getting traction on the things we said we're gonna work on in the future. Uh, I wanna know, that's not my intention. I'm not using the scare monitoring tactic in order to be able to say, hey, we've got to do Venus, we got to do Romeo colonies, and we got to do all of this. Uh, I think these things are real. Uh, and I, I, I think we need to think, I need to, we need to acknowledge these things at the very least and, and uh, plant some seeds uh, and uh, cooperate so that it will bumble the outside. There's something flying outside, <laughs> it was very fast. <laughs> Um, yeah. Anyways, I think my case is made and this is the idea, the weird idea of the day. Uh, happy, very happy for feedback and suggestion. I make the videos so that they're available for children because I want my daughter to watch this and other children. And that's why you can't comment on these. So this is YouTube's policy, which makes sense, I guess. Anyways, so this is my idea of the day. Thank you for watching.